Unit 1 Imperialism and Colonialism A Theoretical Perspective Structure 1.0 Objectives 1.1 Introduction 1.2 Colonialism Various Viewpoints Nature of Colonialism Impact on Colony 1.3 Stages of Colonialism First stage, second stage, third stage, 1.4 Let us sum up, 1.5 Keywords, 1.6 Answer to check your progress exercises. 1.0 Objectives This unit presents as a broad discussion on the phenomenon of imperialism and colonialism and tries to to show how this can be helpful in understanding the basic features of historical development in India under the British colonial rule over a period of two centuries. After going through this unit, you will be able to learn what is colonialism, its nature and its various stages the links between colonialism and the world capitalist system and how under colonialism the Indian economy and society were completely subordinate to British economy and political control. 1.1 Introduction Imperialism refers to the process of capitalist development which leads the capitalist countries to conquer and dominate pre-capitalist countries of the world. Under this head, we deal with the development of capitalism in advanced capitalist countries, the mutual relations among advanced capitalist countries, and the subjugation of pre-capitalist colonies by a capitalist country. Also describe as a metropolis or metropolitan country. More narrowly, the term imperialism is used to denote or describe the relations of political and economic domination between metropolis and the country it subjugates or dominates. The country which is so subjugated by the metropolitan capitalist country is described as a colony and what happens in a colony is colonialism. The total system of imperialist domination of a pre-capitalist country is colonialism. The study of imperialism and colonialism is closely correlated and in a way we shall be discussing both but here we shall concentrate more on the study of colonialism while leaving major aspects of imperialism to be taken up in the study of development of capitalism. 1.2 Colonialism Various Viewpoints What does colonialism mean? It is merely the political control or by it is merely the political control by one country on the another or does it indicate a process of economic subordination of one country to another? The understanding of colonialism has a varied form one sorry the understanding of colonialism has varied from one scholar to another. In this section, we will introduce you to various viewpoints on colonialism as well as other related aspects. Number 1 One view represented by a large socialist political scientist and economist is that colonial society was basically a traditional society or in other words, Colonialism retained basic socio-economic elements and structures of pre-colonial society. Post-colonial societies then begin the task of modernization of pre 
post-colonial society. Post-colonial societies then began the task of modernization from a traditional socio-economic structure. Many others see colonialism as representing a transitional society that is a society which was being transformed economically, socially and politically from a traditional pre-colonial society into a modern capitalist society. They believe that even given time enough, colonialism would have succeeded in the task if it had not been overthrown. Number two, still other writers hold that colonialism produce, produces a drastic society in which one sector is modern and capitalist while another section is traditional and pre-capitalist. The two sectors exist side by side without either being strong enough to overwhelm or overthrow the other. Some writers have followed a major radical version of dualistic model. According to them, colonialism begins the task of modernization but fails to complete it given after effort halfway. This leads to arrested growth of the colonial economy and society. Thus, the semi-feudal feature of agriculture are seen as a remnant of the pre-colonial period. Colonialism is accused of preserving these semi-feudal features or at least of failing to uproot them. Number three, many writers see colonialism as nothing more than political domination for or foreign political rule. The weakness of colonialism are seen as weakness of policies followed by individual colonial administrators. Nature of colonialism Colonialism produced a society which was neither capitalist as a Britain nor was it pre-colonial or pre-capitalist. Thus, for example, India under British rule neither resembled capitalist Britain nor was it basically similar to Mughal India. The development of agrarian relations in the colonies in India or Egypt or Indonesia makes this aspect quite clear. For example, landlordism in both Jamindari and Rayotwari areas of British India was something new. It did not exist in Mughal India. It was the creation of British rule. It was the result of the colonial rulers efforts to transform Indian agriculture. Indian agriculture was, was not capitalized but it had many capitalist elements. For example, property relations were capitalist. Lane was now a private property which was freely bought and sold on a large scale. In fact, we can say that the colonial societies underwent a fundamental transformation under colonialism. They were made an integral part of world capitalist system. For example, colonialism in India was as modern as, as modern a phenomena as industrial capitalism in Britain. The two had developed together since the middle of 18th century. Capitalism was by its very nature a world system that is it must cover the entire world but it does not cover the entire world in the same way. It has one phase in the metropolis and another in the colonies. It develops the metropolis as a modern industrially developed country. It underdevelops the colony. The same capitalist process which produces economic development in the metropolis and makes it an advanced capitalist country produces and maintains underdevelopment in the colonies and transform them into colonial societies. 
Colonialism uproots all society and economy, but the new colonial society and economy are as much a barrier to modern, modern economic development as are the old pre-capitalist economy and society. A colony is integrated into or made a part of world capitalist system, but without taking part in industrial revolution or the development of capital production. Colonialism, in fact, blocks the development of modern capitalism in the colonies. Impact on colony. You would like to know the essential features of colonialism. Basic to colonialism are two features. One, one is the complete subordination of the colony to the needs of the metropolis or the imperialist power. And two, second is the economic exploitation of the colony or the appropriation of colo colonies' economic surplus by the metropolis. The economic surplus in the colony is produced in many different ways from traditional agriculture to plantation to modern mining and factory production. But the essence of colonialism is appropriation of this surplus by various classes of the imperialist country. Subordination means that the basic issues of the colony, colony's economy and social and political developments are not determined by the colony's own needs, but by the needs and interests of the metropolitan economy and of the metropolitan capitali capitalist class. Colonialism is thus much more than political control or political policies. It is best seen as a structure, colonial interests and policies, colonial state and administrative institution, colonial culture and society, colonial ideas and ideologies, all function within the framework of colonial structure. Check your progress. Question number one. Which of the following statements are right or wrong. 1. India under British rule resembles capitalist Britain. 2. Capitalism by its nature is a localized phenomena. 3. Colonialism obstructs the economic growth of a country. 4. Indian agriculture has some capitalist elements before India became a country. Question number two discussed in about 10 lines the main feature of colonialism. One point three stages of colonialism. Colonialism is not one continuous phenomenon or unified structure. Colonialism goes through several stages. The subordination of the colonial country and its exploitation remain constant, but the forms of subordination and exploitation undergo changes over time from one stage to another. These changes are linked to several factors. For example, the historical development of capitalism as a world system, the changing pattern of individual metropolitan or imperialist countries' economic, social, and political development, the changing position it occupies in the world system, and the colonies on historical development. Colonialism may be divided into three distinct stages which were related to distinct form of exploitation or sub surplus appropriation. Consequently, its taste represented a different pattern of subordination of colonial economy, society and polity and therefore different colonial policies, political and administrative institutions, ideologies and impact as also different responses by colonial people. 
stages of colonialism for different colonies are not bound by the same time horizons. Different stages occur in different countries at different time. That is, different stages occupy different periods in different countries. But the content of a stage remain broadly the same whenever and wherever it may occur. We should also note that a stage of colonialism does not occur in a pure form nor is there a sub and complete break between one stage and another. For forms of surplus appropriation or exploitation and other features of colonialism from earlier stages continue into the later stages. Different stages are however marked by distinct dominant features. There is a qualitative change from one stage to another. Basic features of colonialism and its different stages can be illustrated from the history of colonialism in modern India. This is especially so because historians agree on treating India as a classic colony. The basic character of British rule did not remain the same through its long history of nearly 2000 years. The changing pattern of Britain's position in the developing world capitalist economy led to changes in the nature of British colonialism in India. That is changes in forms of exploitation and consequently in colonial policies, impact and Indian response. The last two aspects that is impact of colonialism on India and the response of Indian people will be discussed in other units. Colonial policies will also be discussed at length later in other units but we will now discuss the basic feature of colonialism in India during different stages as also the reason for transition or change from one stage of colonialism to another. 1.3.1 First stage this is described as the period of monopoly threat and direct appropriation or the period of East India Company's domination 1757 to 1813. During the last half of 18th century, India was conquered by a monopoly trading corporation the East India Company, the company had two basic objectives at this stage. Number one, the first was to acquire a monopoly of trade with India. This meant that other English or European merchants or trading companies should not compete with it in purchase and sale of Indian products, nor should the Indian merchants do so. This would enable the East India Company to buy Indian products as cheaply as possible and sell them in whole markets at, uh, at as high a price as possible. Thus, Indian economic surplus was to be appropriated through monopoly trade. The English competitors were kept out by persuading the British government to grant the East India Company through a royal charter a monopoly of the right to trade with India and the East. Against the uh, European rivals, the company had to wage long and first wars on land and sea to acquire monopoly against Indian traders and to prevent Indian rulers from interfering with its trade. The company took advantage of the disintegration of Mughal Empire to acquire increasing political domination and disintegration, sorry, disintegration of Mughal Empire to acquire increasing political domination and control over different parts of the country. After political conquest, Indian weavers were also employed directly by the company. In that case, they were forced to produce cloth at below market prices. Number two, the 
the second major objective of colonialism at this stage was to directly appropriate or take over governmental revenues through control over state power. The East India Company requires, required large financial resources to wage wars in India and on the seas against European rivals and Indian rulers and to maintain naval forces, forts and armies around their trading posts etc. East India Company did not possess such resources and the British government neither possessed nor was it willing to use them to promote the company's interests. The much needed financial resources had therefore to be raised in India from the Indian people. This provided another incentive to make territorial conquests in India. Financial resources had to be raised in India for another region. Indian money was needed to purchase Indian goods. This could be acquired either by sale of British goods in India or by export of gold and silver to India. The first method was bad because the British produced hardly any goods which could be sold in India in competition with Indian products. British industrial products could not compete with Indian handicraft products till the beginning of the 19th century. British government heavily influenced by mercantilist theories was also unhappy with the export of gold and silver from Britain. Appropriation of government revenue would also of course increase the profit of the East India Company and dividends of the its shareholders. Both the objectives, the monopoly of trade and appropriation of government revenues were rapidly fulfilled with the conquest of first Bengal and parts of South India and then over the years the rest of India. The East India Company now used its political power to acquire monopolistic control over Indian trade and handicraft products. Indian traders were gradually replaced and ruined while the weavers and other craftsmen were compelled either to sell their products at uneconomic rates or to work for the company at low wages. It is important to note that at this stage there was no large scale import of British manufacturers into India, rather the reverse occurred. That is, there was increase in export of Indian textiles etc. The weavers were for example not ruined at this stage by the British imports but because of the company's monopoly and their exploitation by being forced to produce for the company under uneconomic conditions. With political conquest, the East India Company acquired direct control over the revenues of Indian states. Moreover, what company and its servants extorted illegally immense wealth from Indian merchants, officials, novels, rulers and jamindas. In fact, this element of plunder and direct seizure of surplus was very strong in the first days of colonialism. Gradually, large number of highly paid British officials were appointed in India and their salaries and pensions became a form of surplus appropriation. There was intense struggle within Britain, especially among aristocracy and the landed gantry for British appointments in India. An important feature of colonialism during this period was that no basic changes were introduced in colonial administration, judicial system, transport and communication, method of agricultural or industrial production, forms of business management or economic organizations, except for the permanent settlement in Bengal, which really belonged to the second stage of colonialism. Nor were 
any changes met in education or intellectual field, culture or social organization. Only two new educational institutions were started, one at Banaras for Sanskritic learning and other at Calcutta for Persian and Arabic learning. Even the Christian missionaries and British capitalists who might have acted as a channel for import of modern Western ideas were kept out of British profession in, in, position in India, the only changes were met are 1. In military organizations and technology which contemporary independent Indian rulers were also introducing India armed forces and 2. In administration at the top of the structure of revenue collection so that it could be made more efficient and diverted to the company. At this stage, British rule was not very different from traditional Indian empires which too relied on land revenue collection. Why was this so? Why were so few changes introduced? Because the two basic objectives of colonialism at this stage did not require basic socio-economic administrative changes in India. Colonialism of the first stage could be superimposed over its existing economic, cultural, social and political structures. Also the British rulers did not feel the need to penetrate the villages deeper than their indigenous Indian predecessors had done so long as land ribbon was successfully sucked out through the traditional machinery of revenue collection. There was therefore no need to disturb India's existing economic or political structure or administrative and social organization or cultural and ideological framework. This lack of change was also reflected in the ideology of the rulers. No need was felt to criticize traditional Indian civilization, religions, laws, caste system, family structure etc. for they were not seen as obstacles at that stage of colonial exploitation. The need was to understand them sympathetically so that political control and economic exploitation could proceed smoothly without arousing opposition from Indians on religious, social or cultural grounds. This period witnessed large scale drain of wealth from India. This wealth played an important role in financing Britain's industrial revolution drain of wealth from India continued 2 to 3 percent of Britain's national income at the time. Check your progress exercise 2. Question number 1. Discussed the two major objectives of the East India Company in about 10 lines. Question number 2. Which of the following statements are correct or wrong? 1. Colonialism is a continuous phenomena with no change in forms of exploitation. 2. The various stages of colonialism develop simultaneously in all colonies at the same time. 3. The British government was not willing to use its resources for the promotion of East India Company's interest. Three, sorry, four, the company's servants extorted immense wealth from Indian merchants. Question number three, list the main feature of the monopoly trade phase of colonialism in India. 1.3.2 Second stage. This was a period of exploitation through trade and is also termed as colonialism or free trade during 19th century. Immediately after the East India Company became the ruler over most part of India, an intense struggle broke out in Britain to determine whether interest, whose interest 
would the newly acquired colonies serve? Britain was after 1750 undergoing the industrial revolution. The newly developing industrial capitalists began to attack the English East India Company and the forms of its exploitation of India. The, they demanded the colonial administration and policy in India should now serve their interests which were very different from those of the East India Company. They did not gain much from a monopoly trade in India and Indian products or from the company's control over Indian revenues. They wanted India to serve as a market for their ever-increasing output of manufactured goods, especially textiles. They also needed from India exports of raw materials, especially cotton and foot grains. Moreover, India could buy more British goods only if it earned foreign exchange. By increasing its exports, increasing exports were also needed to enable dividends of East India Company and profits of British merchants and earning the pension of British officials transferred to Britain. But what was India to export? Since the British were for years not willing to let India's textiles be imported into Britain and later their export was no longer economic, these exports from India could consist only of agricultural raw materials and other non-manufactured goods. In other words, to suit the convenience of British industrial capitalists, British coloni colonialism in India must enter its second stage. India must become a subordinate trading partner of Britain as a market to be exploited and as a dependent colony to produce and supply the raw materials and put stuffs Britain needed. India, India's economic surplus was to be appropriated through trade based on unequal exchange. As a result, Britain increasingly produced and exported goods which were produced in factories using advanced technology and less labor and in which level of productivity and wages was high. On the other hand, India produced agricultural raw materials through backward methods of production using great deals of labor leading to low productivity and low wages. This international division of labor was moreover not only highly unfavorable to India but was unnatural and artificial and was introduced and maintained forcedly through colonial domination. The beginning of the change occurred with the process of regulating Act of 1773 and Pitch India Act of 1784, which were primarily the results of intense struggle within the British ruling classes. The East India Company was saved and given a reprieve by the French Revolutionary Wars after 1789, but the company gradually lost grounds by the economic by 1813, when another Charter Act was passed, the company had lost most of its political and economic power in India. The real power being wielded by the British government, which ruled in India in the interests of the British capitalist class as a whole. India could not be exploited in a new way within its economy, existing economic, political, administrative and socio-cultural setting. This setting therefore had to be shattered and transform all along the line. The British Indian government set out to do so after 1813. In the economic field, this means integrating India's colonial economy with the British and world capitalist economy. The chief instrument of this was the introduction of free trade. All important duties in India 
were earlier today totally removed or drastically reduced to nominal rates. Thus, India was thrown open to British manufacturers. Free entry was also now given to British capitalists to develop tea, coffee, and indigo plantations, trade, transport, mining, and modern industries in India. The British Indian government gave active state help to these capitalists. The agrarian structure of India was sought to be transformed in a capitalist direction through the permanent settlement and the riot worry system. The last scale important Im, the last scale imports and their sale in land and even more the last scale export of the bulky raw materials and they are gathering at the ports from long distances inside the country required a chief in each system of transport and communication. Without such a system, India could not be open to large-scale foreign trade. The government therefore improved river, rivers and canals, encouraged the introduction of steamships on rivers and improved the roads. Above all, during the latter half of the 19th century, it encouraged and financed a large network of railways linking India's major cities and markets to its ports. By 1905, nearly 45,000 kilometers of railways had been built. Similarly, a modern postal and telegraph system was introduced to facilitate economic transactions. Many changes were now brought about in the administrative field. Administration was made more elaborate and comprehensive and it reached down to the villages and outlying areas of country so that the British goods could reach and agricultural products drawn from its interior villages in remote spots. Legal and judicial structure of India was overhauled to promote capitalist commercial relations and maintain law and order. The changes, however, related to criminal law, law of contract, and legal procedures. Personal law, including that relating to marriage and inheritance, was largely left untouched since it did not in any way affect colonial transformation of the economy. Furthermore, it was in 1830s and 1840s that English replaced Persian as the official language in India. Lord William Bentick's resolution dated March 7, 1835, stated that the funds appropriated to education would be best employed in English education alone. Modern education was now introduced basically with the objectives to Men, the new vastly expanded administration, but this was also expected to help transform India, its society and culture. Trans this transformation was needed for two reasons. It was expected to one create an overall climate of change and development, two generate a culture of loyalty to the rulers. It is to be noted that it was around this period that many Indian intellectuals like Raja Ram Mohan Roy began to work for social and cultural modernization of different regions, mainly as a part of national regeneration. The second stage of colonialism generated liberal imperialist ideology among many British statements and administrators. The talk of training the Indian people in arts of democracy and self-government Britain was at this time the workshop of the world. It was the only rapidly industrializing country. Consequently, many in Britain believed that the pattern of trade with India could be maintained even if Britain was to withdraw its direct political and administrative control over India. So long as law and order, free trade and sanctity of business contract were maintained there. But even the liberal imperialists believed that it would take Indians a hundred years or more to acquire these virtues and therefore British rules should be maintained and strengthened for centuries to come. If India's socio-economic structure was to be radically transformed, its existing culture and social organization had to be declared unsuitable and decadent. Indian culture and society were now subjected to self-criticism, no racialism was however involved in this criticism 
for it was simultaneously maintained that Indians could gradually be raised to the level of Europeans. The earlier forms of surplus extraction continued during this phase. This plus the costly administration plus the efforts of the force at economic transformation led to a steep rise in taxation and in the burden on the pigeon because of the constant need of colonial administration for funds to maintain military and ad civil administration and for construction of railways and its last reliance on taxation of land which has its own limits colonial administration suffered from constant financial constraints. Consequently, the process of modernization in other fields was reduced to paltry proportions. India played a crucial role in the development of British capitalism during this stage. British industries, especially textiles, were heavily dependent on exports. India absorbed 10 to 12 percent of British exports and nearly 20 percent of Britain's textile exports during 1860 to 1880. After 1850, India was also a major importer of Indian coaches, rail lines and other railway stores. Moreover, Indian Army played an important role in extending British colonialism in Asia and Africa. Throughout these days, Indian wealth and capital continued to be drained to Britain. Third stage. This is described as the era of foreign investment and international competition for colonies. A new stage of colonialism was asserted in India from about 1860s. This was the result of several major changes in the world economy. Number one, spread of industrialization to several countries of Europe, the United States and Japan, with the result that Britain's industrial supremacy in the world came to an end. 2. There was intensification of industrialization as a result of application of scientific knowledge to industry. Modern chemical industries, the use of petroleum as fuel for internal combustion engine, use of electricity for industrial purposes developed during this period. 3. There was further unification of world market because of revolution in means of international transport. The new industries in many industrialized countries consume immense qualities of raw materials. Rapid industrial development also lead to continuous expansion of urban population which needed more and more food. There now occurred an intense struggle for new, secure and exclusive markets and sources of agricultural, mineral, raw materials and foodstuffs. Moreover, the development of trade and industry at home and extended exploitation of colonies and semi-colonies produces large accumulation of capital in capitalist countries. Simultaneously, there occurred concentration of capital in fewer and fewer corporations, trusts and cartels and merger of banking capitals with the industrial capital outlet had to be found for this capital. This led to large-scale export of capital. Once again, the developed capitalist countries began a search and compete for areas where they could acquire exclusive rights to invest their surplus capital. Thus, in their search for markets, raw material, and fields for capital investment, the capitalist countries began to divide and re-divide the world among themselves. Colonialism at this stage also served important political and ideological purpose in the metropolitan, that is the imperialist countries. So we need